Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, let me get started with a couple of remarks, just so that you will remember. We will have a photo take after this talk from June Mulai. Um, please also make sure that when you use your translator headset, you use, um, sorry, you leave them on the table when you go for lunch and return them at the end of the event. And also I would like to apologize on behalf of uh, Jiro Sensei because he could not attend this event today. Uh, please welcome Jun Mulai, Dean of the Faculty of Environmental Study, Environmental Information Study, to give us opening remarks. おはようございます。あの、お集まりいただきましてありがとうございました。えっと、今英語でしか言いません大丈夫ですか レシーバーあった方がいい人、あるいはあるところに行ってくる。全然必要ないってことですよね。ありがとうございます。Well, thank you very much. And I was explaining about the receiver because uh, everything is going to go to go in English, right? And the, she was explaining in English about the use of the receivers. Therefore, I was kind of repeating it in Japanese, right? And the, therefore, you don't need them. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, again, thank you very much for coming. And uh, this is uh, basically the, what the prologue of a uh, cyber civilization research laboratory, which uh, we have been, uh, we, ha we have started. So let me, um, you know, uh, share some of the uh, concept and the background uh, when we started to use the word cyber civilization thing. And uh, so anyway, so well, this is a KU University. So I'm, I'd like to start with uh, our university. So KU University is the uh, uh, oldest uh, university in this country. And uh, uh, actually, it was started, I mean, founded a little bit before the, uh, of the uh, you know, starting of a major era, which was uh, basically closed Japan to open to the world, right? Uh, so we are you know, funding age was a little bit before that uh, opening of the uh, country. So uh, he, uh, of course, uh, uh, he the uh, founder, Yukichi Fukuzawa. And uh, then, you know, so uh, he did a lot of work on the kind of creating the, say, modern world. And uh, then, you know, so uh, he used the word uh, you know, the civilization, introducing the civilization from the uh, Western world and all over the world, and uh, then, you know, uh, having a vision of the future of Japan. So that was uh, uh, Yukichi Fukuzawa's work. Of course, uh, you know, I used uh, kind of uh, nasty things, but it, this makes, you know, the Japanese government printing this, uh, you know, many, many of them. So. Uh, they are doing the advertisement of the uh, university. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then, you know, so uh, look at this one. Uh, this is a book he wrote about after the, he, he was visiting all over the world. And uh, then, you know, so uh, uh, collecting the, you know, reporting of the, all the Western world uh, to Japan. Uh, uh, this book was uh, written in 1866. And uh, uh, on the, this is a cover. And then you know, there is a picture after the cover talking about the concept that he felt, uh, I believe, uh, you know, after the other visiting all over the world. And that it said the four ocean, one family, five uh, races, uh, brothers. So meaning that everybody is gonna be a brother, family, single family. That's a concept after he was traveling uh, around the world. And the left one, is uh, what the human being created, okay? So the steam engine, and uh, then uh, also the uh, sizing means uh, probably the uh, KSI or the uh, legal issue, so society, right? That's a uh, human being created. And uh, then the electricity, and uh, then you know, the uh, uh, communication. Uh, so uh, left, left page is uh, basically what human being created as a tool or the system and the society. So those things is a talking about the single civilization concept. 
And then if you look at this part of the left pages very carefully, okay, um, he, in 1866, he put the, all the, you know, the, the telephone poles around the world and the connecting them, surrounding the world, and the get the, we call it the hikyaku, a messenger, that time, is a running on top of the cable, right? This is the internet, isn't it? This is a, this is a concept. So internet connecting the world and then creating the new civilization. Probably that's a, one of the messages we received from our founder. And the, therefore, the K University Cyber Civilization uh, Research Lab is uh, basically uh, the internet created, internet and the computer science, uh, you know, data creating the new civilization. And the, what's going to be the issue, right? That's a problem. So the civilization is uh, coming from the, all over the world, but uh, basically based on the science and the uh, mathematics, creating the tools, and then they create a lot of creation like our Arctic and uh, you know, the, the buildings and the cities, and they creating the rules. Uh, so that's very much a uh, you know, uh, concept of the cyber civilization thing, right? Cyberspace is a, uh, is a good tool, and then they're creating the new things and the new society. That, therefore, it's a civilization uh, concept. What's different? is the civilization uh, in the past, before the cyber civilization thing. Uh, it was uh, geo-located in uh, different places, different time, and uh, sometimes conflict in them, sometimes uh, you know, they disappear, sometimes uh, you know, uh, arising, so uh, distributed uh, to the different uh, location. But the internet, is a single space. So that is uh, causing a lot of issues today. So uh, um, the uh, state of uh, internet users in the year 2000 was uh, 6%. And uh, that was uh, mostly Asia was that time uh, Japan. So Japan's population of the internet was uh, second to the United States. And uh, therefore, the, uh, the late uh, 90s uh, development of the internet has been done between the US and Japan. Uh, largely in the Europe. Um, but this is a this year thing, and the, we are now exceeding uh, over the 50% of the population. Therefore, the, I think 80% means that uh, most of the people is accessing the internet situation, which is uh, also in Japan, and uh, then the US, and uh, North America, and uh, Europe, right? And the, the, then the Asia is the largest uh, ratio by population, but uh, still 48%, which is uh, you know, a lot of room to grow, in, so as in Africa, right? But uh, I don't think uh, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna take time uh, very much. So uh, probably 2020, 2025 time range, the entire uh, population is gonna be 80% uh, almost uh, accessing the internet pretty pretty much uh, you know achieving thing so the problem is the uh, internet uh, is uh, unlike the uh, previous uh, civilization internet is a single space in the global space internet is a truly global space for the operation of the ip and the uh, routing things so uh, but uh, also this globe is a international space as well so uh, you know the nations is a, uh, you know, occupying the surface of the, uh, this planet, and they are uh, connected together, which is an international relationship. So, but the activities on the cyber civilization thing, and the, then the most of the activity, I, should, I could say, you know, all of activities uh, would be utilizing the benefit of a digital technology which is uh, on the global space as well. So uh, now, and uh, then the real space is uh, still the nation, international, international organization is on the real space. So the question is uh, what gonna be the issue? So uh, it's, uh, 
Um, if you look at this uh, picture carefully, the currency are different, legal uh, issue are different, police are of course are different, the US police wearing a sundress, right? And uh, then they you know, um, the culture are different. You know, the, the vodka writing is only in Japan. The other countries are horizontal writing, right? So that's a, like a culture. We, we need to have a vertical writing still. China is uh, almost giving up the vertical writing. Um, now, um, so different, different culture, different legal system, different social system, but the still, uh, the, all of us are living on the same space on the internet. Um, so the, if there, there is some issues, on this, for example, cyber security issues, then is that gonna be the law of the international issue or the, you know, the physically we can fragment the internet, for example. Therefore, that is that the way? And then they know the important thing is that uh, we all should understand uh, this situation and the startup. This is a plural of uh, cyber civilization time. So uh, thank you very much and enjoy the today's uh, symposium on the Cyber Civilization Research Center. Thank you very much. So we will have our first talk from Jonathan Cave, who's a senior research fellow in economics at the University of Warwick. Right. Um, thank you. And thank you, Jun, for those um, fascinating remarks. I, I hope we get a chance to discuss them, because I think that uh, th there are some particular things. So just before I begin, uh, a bit about myself and a disclaimer. The bit about myself is that I'm at Warwick, where I run the Mathematics and Economics Joint Degree Program. Um, and I'm formerly a member of the Economics Department. And I work on things like Internet of Things and complex adaptive systems and games played on networks. I also am a fellow of the Turing Institute. The Alan Turing Institute in London works on data science or and uh, data ethics in particular, and on artificial general intelligence, machine learning, and algorithmic decision making. And I work for the British government. Uh, in Britain, when uh, laws are passed, or when regulators make significant decisions, they're supposed to, before they make the decisions, assess what the impacts of those decisions are going to be, using uh, economic analysis and other types of evidence. And when they've prepared these impact assessments, uh, there is a group of people on something called the Regulatory Policy Committee that determines whether or not those impact assessments are a fair and neutral view of what those rules are going to do. Uh, often when you see such documents, they tend to be rather business cases or arguments why a particular policy should be pursued. And so our job is to determine whether or not the impact assessment is fit for purpose, and I'm the economist member of that committee. It doesn't mean that I can stop bad rules, otherwise you would be asking me about some of the more remarkable decisions of the British government. Um, but it does mean that I can say to politicians that the evidence only takes you so far, and you have to do the rest on moral, political, or ethical grounds. Uh, so those are the three hats that I wear. And a lot of what I'm going to say has been um, informed by the experience of trying to do things in the world of academia and in the world of policy and also in conjunction with business. So the title of the talk is somewhat grandiose. It's Moving the Boundaries of Humanity. And its origins came in an event we did some years ago at the Cambridge Festival of Ideas that was called uh, The Internet of Things and the Boundaries of Humanity. And the essential question is not whether technologies can serve the interests of human beings, but whether human beings, when they begin to be served in that way, remain human in the sense that we normally think of them as human, and remain, uh, let's say, the masters of machines rather than, in some sense, their servant. 
And this will be something that's familiar probably to all of you. You get a new bit of ICT technology, a new uh, more capable uh, smartphone or office application or something like that. And yes, it allows you to do the things you were doing before quicker, perhaps more accurately, more efficiently. But eventually, it offers you other things or requires you to make decisions that are not decisions about what you're writing, but about the format in which it's expressed or other things like that. And you spend an awful lot of the time that you have gained in serving the interests of the machine. Now, another example of that would be in the Internet of Things. If I, for example, had a device implanted in me that monitored a medical condition and determined when I needed to have a medication administered to me, let's say insulin, for example, if I were a diabetic. Now, that, in a certain sense, could reduce the disruption caused by my medical condition, and it would mean that I would, need, I would get no more medicine than I needed at no other time than when I needed it. But suppose now that the medicine had side effects, and I didn't like the side effects. So I, the intentional person, told that device not to give me the medication when my biomedical self said that I needed the medication. Now this device has a problem. It doesn't know how to serve my interests. It could serve the biomedical me by giving me the medication, or it could serve me, the person inhabiting this, by not giving me the medication. Now, if it were a human agent that were doing that, a doctor, for example, or a carer, they would know something about me. They would know about me over the course of time. They would have studied me, and they would have a sense of my ability to rationally express and pursue my interests. A machine could do that. A machine could learn about me as well. It could learn about me in the past, but only about things that I decided about in the past. So we have a clever machine. It's got artificial intelligence, so it does something else. It conducts experiments with me. It gives me little choices to make and studies how I make those choices. Now, one view of this is the data analytic machine learning point of view, where the machine learns about the system it interacts with, namely me. But of course, when you give me an experiment, when you subject me to an experiment, you change me. And so from the machine's perspective, its objectives are equally well served by learning how to serve me or programming me through going through these experiments into the kind of person who is easy to serve who doesn't give contradictory instructions, for example. Now, at that point, my human agency and the significance of the decisions that I make change. Because, in a certain sense, even the decisions that I'm offered are an artifact of a system, a system which I may have set in motion, we as human beings have set in motion, but which I certainly didn't design in the sense that it shows me what I expected to see. So, in a certain sense, when I think about civilization made up of human beings and civilization where machines influence those human beings and their relation to each other, and even a society now in which machines occupy roles formerly exclusively the province of human beings, for example, sitting on boards of directors of private equity companies, we now have algorithms doing those roles, and we have people who respond so quickly and with so little foresight to the information that hits them from the system that they behave almost as though they were algorithms in themselves, then I think it's important to ask where this civilization is leading us and what kinds of people we will be inside it. So I, I, even though this is largely sort of abstract nonsense in, in a certain sense, um, it's informed by my life as an economist and a policy person so in discussion, I hope that we can uh, get into the more practical implications of it. Um, now, let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay, now, so where I want to start with is a concept of people that is not predicated on people as isolated individuals, but recognizes that we're connected to each other and to uh, technical systems and other forms of systems. We get information from those systems. We are offered choices that influence those systems. We exchange information with each other. And if I, for example, observe something, this is one of the big regulatory problems that we see with things like self-regulation, 
There may be people who can observe information that would be relevant to my decision. But if it's not relevant to what they have to do, they won't observe that information. You see this in government all the time. We had a policy in the European Union uh, that you may have seen these stickers that go on appliances that say how much energy they use, sort of A, B, C, D, down to G. Those stickers are supposed to be a visible indicator of the energy efficiency of the device. Why do we have them? So that when people think about what device to buy and they think about the features it offers and the price that's charged, they also think about the environmental consequence. It's not telling them what to do, but it's giving them a salient bit of information that could influence their choice. And if people begin to respond to that information, then it becomes profitable for manufacturers and the engineers they employ to design more efficient devices. So the idea was to help the market work together to do things that were beyond the immediate buying and selling relationship of the market. But the internet created a problem. There were two regulations that did this. The eco-design regulation, which set a minimum standard for energy efficiency, and the eco-labeling the eco directive, which said that you had to provide this information in a way that made sense to people. But people don't gather all the information before they've begun to make up their minds, then make up their minds, and then act on that decision. That's not the, the literal structure of how we decide. So what had happened was that as internet marketing uh, spread, this information was coming too late. Too late in the sense that the sticker was attached to the physical machine. And although people didn't buy washing machines over the internet in the sense that you would then download the washing machine, we'll, we'll get there, right? That's what additive manufacturing is going to do for us. But we weren't there yet. What would happen is you go online, you compare all these things, you make a decision, and you've made up your mind or created a short list before you walk into the store. So the information comes too late to influence the decision. And this regulation, which up until the growth of internet commerce had been responsible for 50% of the reduction in household energy use in the EU, suddenly began to lose force. So we had to come up with a regulation for how you make this information available on the internet. And it wasn't just to restore the original function, because our idea was that by making this information machine readable, you invite other people into the discussion not just the consumer and the manufacturer and the seller, but third parties who could take private information about your electricity tariff, for example, and tell you, you specifically and no one else, what this machine would cost to use. Or you could search for machines using this information as a key search term in a way that you, you couldn't have done otherwise. So the idea was to restore some of that function, maybe even to improve on it. But the point I wanted to make was that all the technical information about these energy-using appliances was locked up inside the DG Ener, the D D Directorate General for Energy in the European Commission. And all the thinking about the algorithmic aspects of this and the uh, user interface aspects of this and the graphics aspect uh, was locked up inside DG Connect, the Directorate General for basically information society things. And the information didn't flow between those two things, because information was power, and some of the things that DG Connect needed to know, DG Enter could have observed, but didn't, because it wasn't their job to observe them. So the exchange of information beyond the functional requirements of the people who get it may be a very important part of the nature of this civilization, that we move away from traditional assignments of power and responsibility to something which at least in prospect is more open, where if it is good to exchange information and you understand the consequences of doing it, then, then it will happen. Now, we have mechanisms for doing this kind of thing. We have competitive mechanisms. If I have a better way of making an appliance, then presumably if you care about uh, the energy efficiency, you'll buy it from me, and it will become more environmentally fit, and the other one will go away, and we'll, we'll get better things. We also have ways of cooperating, of exchanging information, uh, before we put things on the market or before we put policies in place. Now, these mechanisms make um, interfere with each other to a certain extent. If we let large industries cooperate, for example, to control harmful content on the internet, they may find it useful to cooperate on the prices they charge and the way they divide up markets 
in ways that would break the effectiveness of competition. So collusion is sort of the dark side of uh, cooperation in the same way that conflict is the dark side of competition. You can't assume that just because people behave in a certain way, the right outcomes will happen. Now, the other thing here is that we're not connected, each one of us, to everybody else. We are connected to certain people. Now, the internet kind of blinds us in, in a certain sense in doing that, because we could, leaving aside certain firewall types of ideas or aliasing types of ideas, stuff that happens way up the stack, we could contact anyone else in the world. But we've only got headspace to think about a certain number of people, and so there are certain things to which we pay attention and certain people to which we pay attention and others that we ignore. So when we think about the function of this exchange and the way in which we interact, we need to think about the wiring, the topology, in the sense of what is close to what, of this network and how it changes. Now, one of the things that we've seen, so I had a PhD student, for example, who looked at the subprime crisis in the United States. And the question she was trying to ask was, why was it such a global crisis? Uh, it's, it's a financial network, and the thing about networks, as I learned a long time ago at RAN, is that no nodes are essential, right? You can remove nodes, uh, like the United States, and you can route around the nodes, and basically the network should carry on. But what she found was that traders out around the world were looking in all directions, each one looking at different pieces of information, and their interaction was how the information got organized together. The subprime story, however, and anxiety about what the Fed was going to do in response to this apparent wave of, of uh, defaults on mortgages, was such a compelling and interesting story that all the traders began to look towards the United States. And if you looked at the correlation structure of the movement of assets, all of a sudden a causal structure emerged that had not been there before. Everything was oriented in the same direction. And in many complex systems, it's that shared orientation, everyone paying attention to the same thing, that loss of degrees of freedom that heralds a disruptive phase change. Right? It's one of the things that you look at. If you can't tell what's going on in the system, you can at least get a sense of how robust and resilient that system is. Well, civilizations are a bit like that. When they become obsessed with certain individual things, a lot of things happen that nobody would have intended and nobody would have liked to. One could always make the examples, but then there are times when we pay attention to things, as is happening now with COP24, and not much is happening, right? We've been paying attention to what's happening to the environment for quite a while, and yet the data for this year for CO2 emissions suggests that we're not actually prepared to act on it. But that's another hobby horse. So, what I want to say was that when I think about societies, I think about these social networks what we pay attention to and how, whom we choose to communicate with and whether we believe that communication or regard it as essential to what we do or not. So the fact that we could communicate determines a kind of capability, but it's not the same as the action, what we, what we actually do. So there is a dual way of viewing this. One is that we have people who are linked by belonging to the same societies, and society in this sense is something that overlaps, right? I'm an American, I'm British, I'm an economist, I'm all kinds of things, that each of those gives me different connections. But, and sometimes I'm linked to people that I don't share common interests with, that, that I regard as a threat, for example, or a challenge to my sense of myself. But you could take the reverse perspective and say that these societies, like the engineering disciplines or the economic system, are linked by the people who belong to both of them or pay attention to both of them. And from a sort of formal analytic point of view, that may be more productive. But the same is, of course, true with values and ideas. We have this notion, for example, that a certain kind of capitalism and a certain kind of democracy go hand in hand with each other. Because for some brief moment of time, they have been very fit in the environmental in, uh, instance. But they're not the same. They're not even examples of the same kind of thing. In a democratic system, you tend to want to see more democracy everywhere. And the corruption is when people retreat from democracy through one means or another. In a capitalist system, you, you don't want the others to be actively competing with you. 
That's a consequence of the effective operation of the system. What you want to do is to drive them out of business and have the market for yourself, because you make more profit that way than you could in a competitive market, even though it's better for society if the market is competitive. So there's something not quite the same about these things that makes their alignment for some period of time appear maybe more predestined uh, than it is. And I'm deliberately trying to be provocative there. So when I think about civilization, just to round off that slide, I'm thinking about an ensemble of societies, a whole bunch of societies that interact with each other but are not one huge global society. And what I took from Jun's remarks was that there are these global issues, but it's highly unlikely that we will have global laws to deal with those issues. I also think of it as an evolutionary process. And to me, evolution means that three things are happening. There's variation that is not intended, let's say making mistakes or mutations and so on. There is a process of selection that determines which ones get bigger and which ones die away. <clears throat> and it could be a formal scientific process of testing hypotheses, for example, or looking at the evidence for a policy. Or it could be an informal process, what flies in an electoral process, what makes money in, in a commercial market. And the third part is the heredity part, copying what other people do. Maybe getting it wrong, but trying to copy it so the good things not only do well in their lifetime, but they persist and they leave shadows, and that gives direction to the whole process. When these three things happen, we have evolution. And what I want to say is that for me, civilization is not a state, and it's not even a destination. It is a process. And so when I think about cyber civilization, I'm thinking about something where the scale is different than the one that we have learned to manage or survive in. The speed is different. The scope is different. And the question is, is that overall process coherent? And does the fact that part of the process has gotten a lot faster than it used to be, does that make a difference to whether it stays on the road or, or the wheels come off? <coughs> now, what this leads me to is a notion of sort of delegation. That in a complex society, we don't do all the things we need for ourselves. And one of the particularly important things in the development of the world we live in today is something like the division of labor and the delegation of labor. It's not efficient for me to do everything for myself because there are other people who would do them better or because it takes me time to switch from one task to another. I'm sure you've all experienced that. Living as a peripheral to a, an, a, an email stream or a series of political or academic decisions means that the moment you've started to think about something, you're pulled away to think about something else. And so if there is a good outcome of your action, it comes from the collective action of many people, and it, it's much less among in, in your own internal reflection. And this is a change in our civilization from times when we had gentlemen scholars or people who could serve as the reflective conscience of society removed from the cut and thrust of business, and people who could engage in business, and then their activities would feed that reflective function. Sometimes people like Keynes, for example, moved from one world to another, but it was quite clear that when Keynes was up in Cambridge, that was not the same Keynes as who was in the war office or in London, in the, in the city. Now, this breaking a task into many steps that could then be handed off to other people, that's what algorithms do. You have a problem, and you have a series of steps to solve the problem. Not a particular program or anything, just a series of steps. And that is an algorithm. So what we've done all along has been algorithms. And sometimes even formal mathematical algorithms have been around for a long time. In the Bible, there is an algorithm for finding an equivalent area of a circular tent and a square tent. It has significance, religious significance, but it is a constructive algorithm for deriving uh, the value of pi. And it, it, so it's, it's quite a long while ago. Um, and when we have those steps, we can then hand them out to people who can do them very well or with whom we can structure certain relationships. The structures that we put on the way we hand out those tasks <coughs> are economic structures, for example, delegation and contracting. They're political structures, they're scientific structures. When we work on a problem like climate change, there are physical aspects, there are biological aspects, economic, and so on and so forth. So we've broken them into the discipline, united, hopefully, by this common problem. But it doesn't always work out that way. 
But a complex civilization works, if it works at all, by this kind of structured decomposition and the communication that allows the different bits to talk to each other. They also allow us to deal with the fact that we're not all the same. If I can break up the tasks, and I can find people who do certain tasks particularly well and have them do those tasks. And so we can match it to the aptitudes of people and their skills. Not only can they do the tasks, but if we're lucky, they want to do the tasks. So professions, for example, you want doctors who want to heal people. You want students and mathematicians who want to solve problems, not those who just want to learn techniques and hand them off. <coughs> they also let us go deeper than generalists could go. Because if I focus on a particular thing, I can go very far into it and do things like when you write a PhD thesis. You write stuff that nobody else in the world, perhaps, except for a very, very few people, maybe I'm just speaking here as a game theorist, is interested. Um, and yet, the implications of that, understood by people who are not so deeply embedded, can be useful to society. And if somebody wasn't prepared to go that deep, all we would have is sort of general interdisciplinary hush. Um, now, I don't want to say bad things about it, interdisciplinarity. I, I love doing it, and it is valuable, but it's not the only thing. And finally, this separation or differentiation allows the societies themselves to become more diverse, more resilient, particularly to the kinds of challenges that we didn't set out to face, the things that, that emerge and hit us in the face. And that means that we get a certain kind of civilization, one that thinks about handing out tasks. It has skills of management and agency. You know, you're acting on my behalf. And it therefore needs to develop not only contracts and formal structures, but an ethical structure that goes with the fact that we have interlinked interests, not just because we fish from the same pond, but because we have chosen to become dependent on each other. And that interdependency is very important. So in Egypt, for example, when they built the Aswan High Dam, they changed the nature of, your, of Egyptian civilization from one which was locally barter-based and mutually interdependent to one in which I and my neighbors and my neighbors' neighbors were all producing sugar for the same global market. We went from being complements and fellow community members to being competitors in a market. And all kinds of other social structures that we didn't think were in trade began to be damaged by that technological change. Now, sometimes we delegate the tasks, and what I've talked about is we delegate them to human beings. And by doing so, we can expose certain externalities. If I hire somebody to work for me, then I may be, become aware, not just of the skills he brings to the task, but the sustainability of those skills, the life that he lives. The Quaker capitalists of the late 19th century understood this quite well, built towns for their workers to live in, gave them schooling, you know, all kinds of things. Johnson's Wax, where my father worked, kept all of its staff on during the Depression. They sent me to university. These were things that were not connected with the bottom line, not even the eventual bottom line. It was a moral responsibility because people had given to you of their time. And you, you had some responsibility. And it came through that delegation relationship. And those more profound relationships bring up other things that are affected by our civilization. A concept of responsibility, for example, or accountability. Notions that it is useful to be honest, even when honesty may not be, have some direct payoff. Um, notions of privity, as distinct from privacy. Privity is a relational concept. If I tell you something in privity, I'm trusting you not to use it in a way that will damage my interests. It doesn't mean that I know how you're going to use that information. It means that between us is a virtual person with interests, and we are invested in that person. And so you get networks of privity. They, they work better than privacy concepts in many cases. Anyway, that means that we get these algorithms in the form of the values that underpin the society. And we articulate them, and then we instantiate them by you know, making decisions on the basis of those. And that struggle to make things real, to learn from the experience, to apply them when lower order approaches, rules of thumb and just ordinary behavior fail, that allows us to progress. And it leads to civilizations that have more of a structure than that of delegation. They have families, communities, economies. They have joint property rights like the environment or uh, trust that we share between ourselves and don't 
particularized to individuals to put through markets. But it also lets us decentralize tasks, not only hand them out in a hierarchy, but say, okay, Dave, you make the decision about that. It's my interest at stake, but I want you to make that decision. Not because I think you'll necessarily make it better than I would, but because, because it is your decision to make, you'll take it seriously in a way that I couldn't take it seriously. So the structure of our shared identity comes out of these relationships. And that decentralization, as we know, has enormous benefits. But it does require that the systems that we engage with be well regulated in a sort of uh, 18th century meaning of the term. A well regulated system in that sense is one that does the, the, what the people who are engaged in it expect it to do. It doesn't mean there's a regulator, it just means that the system works, right? A competitive economy, a perfectly competitive economy, is a well regulated system. It delivers certain efficiencies and people don't engage in it in ways that damage their collective interests. Um, and in order to make that work, because we have power, we may need some interference from other kinds of organizations. We may need hybrid ones. And that in particular deals with laws and regulation, where by regulation I mean ex post regulation. The kind of regulation that says, you mustn't poison your customers, for example, and if you do, I will punish you. I'm not going to tell you what products to produce, but if you poison your customers, then I'm going to nail you. Therefore, you have an incentive to take care to think about their interests. But that's not the only kind of delegation that we can have. Um, another one is delegating to institutions, and I'll be quite quick about this because I think it's kind of obvious. When things get too large, when they get too fast, when they get too complex to understand, we package up a lot of that uncertainty into an institution that becomes responsible for certain things. So a long time ago, Bakunin said that in the beginning, we had to defend ourselves against murderers and thieves and get our food and all the rest of it. And we had certain, a rich package of natural freedoms. We could do whatever we wanted to do. And only our survival would determine whether it was the right thing to do. But then we got together into societies more efficiently to protect ourselves against murderers and thieves. And we gave up some of those liberties in exchange for that. <clears throat> so we formed the institutions as a superior human technology for actually living. But what Bakunin pointed out, and what we can see in a different way today, is that that went full circle. And the societies began to protect us only from other societies. And once again, it fell to us to protect ourselves from murderers and thieves. Only we'd given up the powers that would have allowed us to do it to the state or to these larger institutions, particularly when they define our existence or our sense of identity. Now, an institution is not a human being. It may be made up of human beings, but those who study, for example, corporate finance or financial economics will know that the structure of the corporation, the culture inside it, the organizational psychology of the corporation determines how it's going to behave. It's not, as we teach our freshman students, just a machine for maximizing profit and minimizing costs. Um, and so that relation between the humans and the non-human institutions in which they are found is, is very important. Marx said a long time ago that for most people, work is their main contact with reality, by which he meant stepping out of your own individual situation and seeing other people whose interests were similar to yours, seeing yourself in other people so that you could then act together collectively. When I was in LA, there was a spill of trichloroethylene into the groundwater in East LA, a very poor Hispanic-speaking part of town. So they sent letters to everyone's house saying that their water was poisoned. The letters were in English, so they then sent them again in Spanish. But 60% of the population couldn't read effectively, so they sent people door to door to tell them that their water was poisoned. Now what could those people do? They couldn't afford to buy bottled water, still less to bathe in it. But they could act collectively in their fear and their anger. They could act politically to do something about it. And that mobilization of the institution, an institution or common identity that hadn't existed before the spill, it was called into existence by the spill. It's how the immune system of the society worked to deal with that problem. And so we can view this sort of institution as a set of rules or a network of contracts or as a network of people that has a certain fixity or resistance to change. It's not bounced around by everything that happens. And so therefore, it can learn. And it will have some direction to it. 
It involves some concept of authority, some surrender of sovereignty. <coughs> and, but when we surrender sovereignty, we also may surrender responsibility. And that's an important part. If I say that befail is befail, which was the German term used in World War II, orders are orders. I, can, I know I can't understand the interests of the country, so I'll just do what the country or the firm or whatever tells me to do. The things that the bankers did in the, in the, the wake of 2007, 2008, were not because they were evil people, but because they had chosen to limit the purview, the moral purview of what they chose to do. And there are many, many forms of these institutions, you know, democracy and capitalism and what have you. There is not really a clear winner. It's not obvious that there should be because they should compete. But, oh, there we go. <coughs> what I really want to talk about was delegation to machines. Now, machines are not human beings. Some kinds of machines are pretty simple. So, for example, I will use a plow to plow up the ground rather than doing it myself. So I take certain tasks that are time consuming, boring, maybe even risky tasks, and I have a machine do them for, for me. That machine, I understand its actions and it acts on my behalf. Now that's a good thing in a certain ways. It frees up time, right? A, um, <coughs> a horse in the plow does a lot more than an individual can in terms of the, their ability to grow food and support a community that has some degree of food security and therefore can afford the leisure to become civilized. That's sort of what happened in Egypt with the periodic flooding of the Nile. It did two things. It refreshed the fertility of the land and it concentrated the people during the time of the floods, concentrated the population along the Nile, and the concentrated population with time on their hands when they couldn't grow crops because the ground was flooded was a resource that the emperor, that the pharaohs could use to build the civilization, including writing and all the rest of it. Had they all been doing subsistence agriculture, they would probably never have been able to do that. Right? So there, there's a certain dynamic to being able to automate these tasks and freeing up time is one thing. It can reduce risk, of course. It can reduce certain kinds of error, error. But it can also enable a certain kind of human development. When I use a machine for what I designed it for, when I first start using it, I do it in a very clumsy and direct and trivial way. Over the course of time, I may develop an intuition about how to use that machine. I may use it to express aesthetic feelings. An example would be a musical instrument. People become very attached to particular musical instruments. Um, if you then give them a synthesizer that will make the same sounds, they won't have quite the same feeling in using it. The expression, the bit that's added by the artist to what the composer laid down, the code if you like, uh, will be absent. The aesthetic quality and some of the potential not only to engage other people in using it, but to fire their imaginations to new things may be lost. So the artisanal aspect of using these machines is something that we want to be, to be careful to preserve. <coughs> On the other hand, there are some, things, some aspects of this that are bad. Now, one of the bad things is that it removes these boring, time-consuming, and risky tasks. Because being bored is enormously productive of new ideas. One of my great regrets is that when I was a child, I could sit for hours and do nothing at all. I could just think about anything, nothing, not to a purpose, and I could therefore, in the evolutionary sense of the term, do the variation step, discover things that I hadn't set out to find. <coughs> and that, I think, is, is enormously important. You don't want everyone in society to do that, perhaps, but we do need some people to do it. And in university contexts, it, it concerns me when I see students at this time of life when they could pursue anything, narrowing down on the thing that will get them the best job, always means, 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 all the way along with no end in sight except maybe the grave. And I think the society is poor if everyone in it is so focused on the tasks that society has created for it that it can't imagine anything else. So one of the big problems that we have, certainly in Europe, probably as a consequence of demographics around the world, and the growth of knowledge needed to do jobs, is that it is longer before students can begin to work as functioning members of the society, right? It takes a long time in university, a long time in jobs where you're basically learning how to do the job, 
before you start making that contribution. Moreover, we're living a long time, and we're living a long time without becoming decrepit for a larger fraction of that long time, right? Is that the period before death when you can't do anything still remains relatively modest, but our lifespans are increasing, and yet we're chucked off on the, on the rubbish heap when we're 65, 67, what have you. <coughs> now, the interesting thing there is not that the old people could be made to do mentally active jobs, or that the young people couldn't be given programming jobs to do earlier on or do startups when they're in school. It is that they can imagine valuable things to do that may in time become monetized that are not yet being done. Most of the firms that are important today didn't exist 15 years ago. Many of the jobs that are important today didn't exist 10 years ago. And that means that these are new things, things that people didn't prepare to do and then did. We've harnessed some of that creative capability, and technology allows us to do that if we want to do it. But we have to have a reason to do it, and so I mentioned there the Eloy and the Morlocks. This is from H.G. Uh, Wells' War of the Worlds. They, there's a future world in which there are these sort of brutal people who live underground, and they're engineers, basically. They do tech stuff. And then there are these beautiful aesthetic people who live on the surface and appear to have wonderful lives. They've avoided all the unpleasantness of life. Their food is supplied and so on and so forth. And it turns out they're the food for the engineers. They're just a bunch of cattle uh, being raised as food. So if we remove the irritation, we don't get many pearls. So too much automation of the, the, random, uh, the boring stuff may not be a useful thing. It may change the character of civilization. Even doing mindless tasks if you have something serious to do, it's nothing better than rearranging your sock drawer or organizing your office or even taking care of emails if you don't have to think about doing it. Because while you're doing that, you can think about something else. Whereas if you were driving a car or something like that, some essential portion of your intellect would be involved in performing that task. So mindlessness is another uh, very useful kind of thing, can be at least. And the final thing is that if you have simple tasks to do, so you can get your head around and you can say, that's now done, I can move on to the next. There's a feeling of accomplishment that goes with that. And that's important to mobilize the human spirit. When I give advice to policymakers, when, when my organization does, it's not to tell them where the truth lies or what the good policy is. It's to give them enough of a sense that they understand what they're doing, that they have the courage to act. Because otherwise, they will think and think and think and think and things will get worse. I had a friend at the World Bank whose motto was, don't get it right, get it done. And there is an element there where, you know, the good being the enemy of the best and all that. So this can lead to this particular form of delegation to machines that we control, feel we can control and understand, leads to machine cultures, engineering types of cultures. And it may lead us to think too simply about deeper problems. So if I worry about privacy, for example, in Europe, I tend to reduce that to data protection. Well, those data are not me. They're not even personal data in most cases. They were attached to me by the state or by a bank or by something else, a transaction that I've done. They're nothing essentially me about them. But then we can say, okay, we've solved the privacy problem. Um, but I, I could go on about that forever. Um, so if it makes us think too simply, or we don't join up the, the things that we do because of the outcomes we expect, or the things that we do out of a sense of moral duty, which Kant would have thought was our essential liberty, because it's not the world pushing us around, it's us moving ourselves. So the ability to connect up the things that we do because we wish to do them for some reason that we can't interrogate, or because it's in our interest to do them, may be important to helping us avoid mistaken decisions, uh, automation that goes too far. Um, and the way in which we deal with this is by having not just a civilization, not just laws and regulations, but things like standards or an ex-ante regulation, something that sets the ground rules but doesn't overly constrain what happens afterwards. Now, beyond that decision uh, delegation is a kind of delegation to algorithms that we, they're not the same as code, Algorithms and computer programs are not uh, quite the same as each other. They might start by doing computational tasks, but eventually they become cognitive tasks, right? We 
the symbolic processing would be an example of that. And we are not, our intellect is not just adding numbers together, just solving well-specified quantified problems. We know that it's something more. One way we can discover what it is is to automate as much as possible of the things that we think we are, and, and we can be the residuum of whatever's left. They, algorithms divide into two kinds. There are the most static ones that do what they were set out to do, and the ones that learn. The static algorithms, at least we can audit if we can't control them, and we can put controls around them. The ones that learn may not be unwrappable in that same way, any more than each of us is unwrappable to the others. You may know where I've gone to university or what I've studied, but you don't know what it's done for me, to me. And so you can't exactly internalize me or anticipate what I'm going to do. And that uncertainty is enormously productive. So when we have these deep learning algorithms, we may not be able to control their operation or even to understand what it does. And they're not human, so they contribute to civilization in different ways. We don't think, for example, that they have intention. Um, of course, we, we wouldn't know, and you know, there's all tons of science fiction about that. I'm not, I'm not gonna go there. Um, but it's certainly true that the use of algorithms and the different kind of trust we put in something as objective as code compared to something as subjective as another human being may mean that we respond differently, even if it's to the same cue. And that difference in our interaction will mean that the way we have architected society by assuming that people are or wish to be rational or that consent lifts moral responsibility. So if I give people information and say, are you okay with this? Then that's fine. I mean, GDPR, for example, asked me to approve the processing and collection of my data. <coughs> First of all, I spend a ton of time, time that is stolen from me, in answering those queries. Secondly, and quite obviously and predictably, I don't pay attention to that. I can't think through what the consequences are, so I just tick OK because I want to go on to this thing. So the responsibility has been abrogated, right? It's gone off the desk of responsible parties like information commissioners. It's been put onto me in the sure knowledge that I will not be able to discharge that responsibility. That seems to me deeply unethical, but it is something that this form of automated decision making allows. And in particular, the rules that we have for automated decision making, the right to an explanation, for example, which is in GDPR, they are of this character. Because the way in which you could explain to me why I didn't get this loan or why I was given this medical treatment is not the way the, the, the finance officer or the doctor or the lawyer understands this. It's certainly not the way the computer programmer who did the algorithm that in all probability made that decision understood it. So it's not the kind of thing to which I can properly give consent. And so it changes, it, it introduces a kind of virtual authoritarianism into society. I'm being given these choices, I exercise the choices, but in no meaningful way. Uh, but it takes them off the, the plate of the person who gave me the choices. Um, now, there are feedback loops throughout this, and I just wanted to mention a story, it's an old story by now, back in May 2010, um, in financial markets, automated financial markets, there is not such a thing as the price of an asset. What we have are pairwise exchanges of asset, right? I may have five shares of this, they may have 10 shares of that, Jerry may have three shares of the other. If we agree to an exchange between us, there's an exchange ratio that applies to that willingness to trade. And there is some demand and some supply that lies behind that, right? So now, Lisa, for example, may have 20 shares of something else, and she wants to know what she can get for it. She can look at the trade that took place between us, but that demand and that supply no longer exist. They're obsolete information because that trade has been made. I've been satisfied. So how do I find out about the demand that is out there? One way I can do it is to issue a lot of quotes. Now, I don't want to quote a price for my whole 20 shares of stock because it might be a price that's too low for what I'm trying to sell. So I'll have a structured series of quotes. And when somebody bites, I cancel all the quotes that are below it. And tick, tick, tick. So it's not anything more than a way of sampling the future, the bit that's relevant to me, on the basis of what I know from the past information. So we have these algorithms that do that. And there was an algorithm uh, in uh, New York that issued a ton of quotes, far too many quotes. 
Now, these quotes could help the market operate inf inf efficiently in an informational sense, but not necessarily in a technical sense, because the volume of those quotes overwhelmed the electronic networks through which the information flowed, and the information wasn't properly time-tagged. So this algorithm over here was getting information about transactions that had long ago been made or canceled. It didn't know it was operating on stale information. Okay. And that gave it the chance to issue more quotes. It created a feedback loop. And that feedback loop had the consequence that within about a minute and a half, a vast amount of value was wiped off the face of the market. Now, within about 29 minutes, all that value was back in the market because there was nothing behind it except this unfortunate interaction between the informational efficiency of an algorithmic market and the electronic efficiency of the networks through which the information flowed around. But not all the money was back in the same pockets it was in at the start of the exercise, and that led to certain things. One was a new kind of regulation, the circuit breaker rule. But as you may know, Beijing put in a circuit breaker rule and the thing about the circuit breaker rule was it would suspend trading for like 10 minutes if the stock moved 5%, and it would suspend it for the day if the stock kept moving when it resumed in the same direction uh, and it had moved by 7%. So what was happening was people knew when the stock started moving. They didn't know if it was a random movement or a systemic movement, but if you had stuff you wanted to sell, you didn't want to sell it once the price had collapsed. So when it started moving down, 1% became 5% because everyone would start selling their stock as quickly as possible, which drove the price down. So this sort of magnet effect meant that if you had this control, the market immediately jumped down to 7%. So they canned that circuit breaker rule because it had this effect. But more profoundly, and this is the thing I want to make, mention, the operation of these algorithms and the sort of new forms of market manipulation that came up with them led to a kind of change in the psychology of traders. No longer trying to sort out signal from noise, but something called normalization of deviance. When you see things that you can't understand, you say, oh, it's the system, it's the machines doing this, it's the algos interacting in a bad way. Which means that the normal immune system function of society to respond to a challenge by changing the way things happen, get short-circuited. We become less responsive until things become um, irreversible. Okay. So, all, all I wanted to say was that the structure of these feedback loops, and in the case of the flashcards, there are actually six quite distinct feedback loops. I've, I've described one of them. Uh, lend a kind of complexity to the system, and complex systems have this property of emergence. And emergence comes in two forms. There's weak emergence, which is stuff that we just didn't expect because we were too stupid to think things through. But then there's strong emergence, which is stuff that we cannot possibly anticipate on the basis of analysis of the little parts of the system. It happens more or less at the system level. And strong emergence is a valuable thing. It's how a competitive market functions, right? We should be able to define who produces what and who gets to consume what, and we should pay for the cost of producing the first thing. And the competitive market is the most informationally efficient device we've ever come up with or could ever come up with in terms of how much has to be processed by each person for solving that problem. In the same way, a society, there's a, a nice little algorithm of, that's been built of social interactions where there are people inside society called leaders who solve problems with the uh, aid of followers and they don't scale terribly well. And if you let that thing operate, it solves certain optimization processes much more effectively than any other algorithm we've come up with. So, I mean, the idea of society, it has this functional definition that's very important. But it also has to deal with certain limitations. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention those. Robin Dunbar is an evolutionary psychologist, and he's noticed that we have room in our minds for about six close friends and about 50 uh, acquaintances who are also, we feel, feelings of amity towards, and about 150 people that we know. The, the friends we know as people, we know them in the round. We, we can anticipate what they're going to do. The people on the outer fringes are kind of avatars. You are an example of this, but you could be replaced by another person. But that structure of the human mind, like the structure of orbitals in an atom, determines the kinds of societies that we can build. 
Now, one can develop that theme much further, but it's those linkages and loops that give structure to this society. So, the final thing is, what happens? What, what can we do about this? Can we continue to patch up our civilization in the face of these challenges by making it the same as it was before? Or do we have to be able to make some kind of quantitative change? Now, I see the CCRC as being a place where that kind of deep thinking can happen, where we can step out of the cut and thrust of these things, and we can analyze them, not necessarily using the protocols and paradigms of the past, but just see them for what they are. And this is what machine learning's great strength is, and it's also its great weakness. It approaches all data as unstructured data sets. It looks for patterns of correlation. So it drives out modeling. In financial trading, uh, a, a moving average mechanism written in bespoke silicon will outperform any Black-Scholes or OPM type of pricing model, which has to be written in software. So the world becomes full of these fast, stupid algorithms, but the system as a whole may be more effective and more clever because the little parts of it don't get to be too clever. But this requires a different kind of thinking than the operational thinking. It requires a certain kind of structured interdisciplinarity involving hard analytics using the data that are available, but also recognizing that those data are not the world. They got to be data because we thought they meant something, so we wrote them down. So the kinds of things you'll hear from the two people who come after me will, I hope, help to complete that picture and indicate why CCRC is an almost unique place connected to the stream of life, but out of the stream and connected to government and the decisions that are made by governments and businesses that can begin to help us at least see these problems and probably seeing them is all we need to do to address them. Okay, I'll stop at that point. Thank you.